Hi friends, Steve Goodyear, and this is a severe warning and an extreme encouragement. Today I want to talk to you about covering. I want to specifically talk about the mercy seat and uh, so many interesting things uh, we're going to get into today. Uh, today is going to be an unusual message. I hope you stick with it right to the end. We have a lot of questions about the ministry of the mercy seat and what that is and what it means and why it's so important and significant to us. What is the symbolism behind the mercy seat? You know, everything in the Old Testament is a a type, a pattern, a shadow of something that's revealed to us in the New Testament. In other words, it's like a prophetic foretelling, a symbol, an allegory. Um, and the mercy seat is a key uh, item in the Bible, in the pattern, in the tabernacle uh, that has not been discussed very much. And so I really want to tackle that today. I want to, I want to look at that in a, some different ways and share with you some things that I'm certain that you've never heard before. Um, so let's dig right in. Father, I pray that you would bless your word and bless the people that are hearing it today. Uh, let it bring life and liberty to them and encouragement and strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, <clears throat> so here we go. The mercy seat is the sixth piece of furniture in the tabernacle. We talked about it in the past, how the tabernacle is a three-stage uh, process. It's a process of approaching God, of coming into the presence of God. It's the outer court, the inner court, the holy of holies. You have to go through these three courts or stages in order to come into, in the third realm, the Holy of Holies, into the very presence of God, to stand before the Shekinah glory, uh, the presence of God, to actually stand before the Ark of the Covenant, uh, which is the seventh piece of furniture. The mercy seat is this gold lid or covering that covers the Ark of the Covenant, that is the top or the lid or the covering uh, for that. And it's called a seat um, because it um, is also referenced as the throne of God. It's the place where God sits or would be seated. Now, it's very important to remember when we're talking about the tabernacle or the furniture pieces in the tabernacle that when God gave the instructions to Moses on how to build this tabernacle and how to build the pieces of furniture and specifically their purpose and their functions, he told Moses something very critical, very important. He explained to him that you have to do this exactly as I tell you, because it is an exact replica, if you will, a shadow, a pattern, a reflection of the real tabernacle in heaven. So we can assume, although we can't see it, we can see the shadow, um, but we cannot see the real one in heaven yet. But we can assume that there is a structure, uh, there is a, a, a way in heaven that this tabernacle on earth is just a pattern of. And the mercy seat is the, the uh, throne, if you will, in the throne room, in the Holy of Holies, in the holiest place, in the inner sanctuary where God dwells. It's the third court that would equate it to love. There's faith, then hope, then love. So uh, <clears throat> it's that dwelling place of love. Uh, we know that love covers uh, and the mercy seat covers. Uh, that's found in the third room, in this, in the third feast. Let's add that layer to this picture. We have Passover, then Pentecost, and then tabernacles. So in this third realm of tabernacles or the Holy of Holies, we have this mercy seat. Now, let's describe it a little bit and see if we can get some more insight into it. The mercy seat is basically rectangular. It sits on the top of the Ark of the Covenant. It has a purpose. It has a position, a place that it belongs, that it's, that it's designed for. And it's made out of one piece of gold, is formed with two cherubim, or angels, a particular class of angels. I personally believe that they're archangels, and my personal opinion, I don't have much to base that on, but but I, I still very strongly believe that that is Michael and Gabriel. Uh, the two archangels, I believe, are the two cherubim uh, bowing over the mercy seat with their wings out as, a, as an additional covering. <clears throat> and this paints for us a picture, an illustration of things that we've seen before in the Bible uh, that should come to your mind at the same time as you're hearing this description of the mercy seat. There was a specific time and a specific manner in which this uh, approach or this entrance into the Holy of Holies and this uh, approach of, to the mercy seat uh, could be made. And only it could only be made by the high priest in the seventh month of each calendar year. And uh, he had to have blood from the sacrificed lamb, the lamb that was sacrificed way back in the outer court or Passover uh, on the brazen altar. And that lamb would represent, obviously, Jesus, the lamb of God, uh, who was sacrificed as an atonement, a covering uh, for our sin. And he would take that blood and put it on the mercy seat. Uh, and then the Shekinah glory, the presence of God, the light, uh, the, the all-consuming fire of God would uh, enter. Uh, and we don't know how that would actually happen, but 
but the presence of God would come down um, <clears throat> and into the Holy of Holies and settle between the two cherubim and hover above or upon the mercy seat where the blood was. Now, this would be the very time that the priest could then have a face-to-face -face encounter with God. Now, have we seen this before? Yes, we've seen this with Moses and the burning bush, wherein the voice came out of the bush that was consumed in fire, but not burned up. We've seen it before with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were uh, the three Hebrew boys in Babylon during the captivity, who were cast into the fiery furnace, heated up seven times hotter. Uh, a type of the Shekinah glory, a type of the presence of God, again, a consuming fire of God. They were in there, and the fire was in front of them, all around them, and there was a fourth man in there, and they appeared to be talking, communing, with this fourth man. And the remarkable thing is, obviously, that they weren't consumed, that the only thing that burned was the ropes, the bondages that were on them were burned up, and they were completely set free in this fire. But they were unscathed. They were protected somehow from this fire. And I'll, I'll give you another picture of this. will be in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned and they were cast out of the garden. God gathered together the uh, participants uh, Adam, Eve, and Lucifer, or Satan, the serpent, and he, and he had a discussion with all of them and told them what their fates would be. There would be a curse on Lucifer. And the one thing that God did say that is uh, most critical was that he gave a promise. He gave a prophetic promise that there would be a seed that would come through the woman that would ultimately crush the serpent's head, implying that there would be a judgment upon the serpent and upon the accuser, the one who tempted and seduced Eve uh, into disobedience and into sin, uh, the result of which is death. But after this happened, uh, the Bible tells us there in Genesis that the tree of life was still there, uh, the one that they had rejected uh, and instead chosen to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But the tree of life was still there, and the power of that tree to produce or to uh, transmit eternal life still exists. And so God, to keep them from going to that tree and eating in their fallen state and living forever, existing forever in their death, in their sin state, uh, in the state of separation from God, spiritually dead. Uh, and I see this not only as a punishment, but maybe even more so as a protection, as a way to protect them from the wrath of God, from the judgment of God, from the curse. Um, so, but he put two cherubim there on the path leading to the tree of life. And between them was a flaming sword that it says turned in every direction. I believe that this is the two-edged sword, the word of God, the consuming fire of God that appeared like a ball of fire between the two cherubim. And this was to warn them to, um, to basically put a barrier, a boundary, uh, that they would have to get through that or past that before they could get back to the tree of life and eternal life. And this was the um, impassable barrier that had to be um, gotten around or gotten past somehow. And uh, that has been the dilemma uh, for mankind ever since. How do we get back to the tree of life? How do we get back to eternal life, back to the garden, back to that place of uh, union, of fellowship, of relationship, of oneness with God, back to that place of the spirit? Um, so this picture of the mercy seat and the cherubim and the ball of fire uh, comes into play in many places. But now I want to add one more uh, that we always forget about when we're talking because it's something that we haven't seen either in the Bible or in real life. Um, and that is the real one, the mercy seat in heaven, in the real tabernacle, the real throne room in heaven. And I believe that's where Michael and Gabriel might be. Uh, and whether it's them or not isn't really relevant, but I, I do believe that, that it is them. Uh, they were the, the two archangels. Uh, <clears throat> Lucifer was the, the third, I believe, the third archangel. Um, so let me, let me go on from there and add another layer to this picture. In the story of Noah, we see not only a, a new beginning, but I believe we see a reflection of the first beginning, a reflection back to, not only back to the, the Garden of Eden and the fall of man and the judgment and the new beginning that began, that started there, but I believe it takes us back into uh, heaven and into the original fall, which is a fall of Lucifer from heaven. Now, let me explain. When Noah <clears throat> came through the flood, and uh, the ark settled on a mountaintop. I believe that could be a picture of the cross, okay? And they come out of that. They're, they're born anew, if you will, a, a new beginning. They're born again. They come out of that uh, from the ark or the cross um, <clears throat> on the hill or on the mountaintop. And there's peace on earth. There, there is a new beginning. There's a cleansed earth. And uh, Noah plants a vineyard. There's not a lot of detail, but the details that we do have are enough, and they're pretty clear to give us the information that we need to know and understand about the foundations. Um, there is a vineyard there that we know that Noah planted. He planted a vineyard and then he drank 
from the grapes of the vineyard that he had planted. And this implies that he was drunk. I don't personally believe that he was in a blackout or that he was uh, crazy drunk out of his mind like we, we think of party drunk now. Uh, but I believe that he was full with the Holy Spirit because the wine represents uh, being filled with the Spirit. And I believe that this is in, indicated at Pentecost uh, when the people watching the, um, the believers that were waiting in the upper room when the Holy Spirit came and they were filled with the Spirit and beginning to speak in other tongues and uh, the effects of that filling of the Spirit uh, caused them to appear as though they might be drunk. They were giddy, they were happy, they were overflowing with joy and laughter and, and this gibberish, this new language that was coming out. More on that later. Um, I'll tell you just briefly, I believe that the, that the tongues that are mentioned there are nothing less than the restoration at that time uh, of the universal language, the one that man lost at the Tower of Babel, I believe was restored at Pentecost in the upper room. Um, and we'll leave it at that. I want to have a whole teaching on that. But that's a very, very interesting subject and has deep implications for uh, the church, for us, you and me today. Um, but anyway, uh, Noah was full of wine from the vineyard and he says he was in his tent and he was in his tent uncovered. And that's really, really relevant. Every detail in the story, uh, every word is extremely important, especially in the beginning of things, um, because these words will set the course, set the tone uh, for everything that comes afterward. So Noah has three sons. He has uh, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Now, if we go back to the world just before the flood and look at that for just a moment, why God even brought the flood? How did Noah wind up here? And then we'll go back and take this back to the uh, tabernacle and the mercy seat. And I'll show you how they completely intimately tie together, how there's revelation in both of these pictures of the real tabernacle in heaven. So the before the flood, the world was corrupt. It says in Genesis chapter 6 that uh, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful, outwardly beautiful, physically beautiful, and they took them and playing by force, violently took them, everyone that they desired. And it says children were born unto them, uh, the daughters of men, when the sons of God came in unto them. So there was this mixture of spiritual heavenly beings that were fallen angels uh, that, that would not stay on their own side of the line, if you will. They, they, they mixed with human flesh. God drew a line and they crossed it. Um, so it says that um, the whole earth was filled with violence or violation. That goes back to the beginning, to the forceful taking of the of the daughters of men, uh, the women, by the angels. And then the next verse, it says, and all men, all men had corrupted their ways or been corrupted by them or because of them. Um, and the corruption is the result of the violence. When uh, corruption just simply means that uh, two things come together uh, and corrupt each other. There's mixture. And the mixture is corrosive or uh, destructive. And that's what corruption is. It's like a simple example might be rust, how rust uh, is the breakdown of metals. When water and metal come into contact and stay in contact for any period of time, the oxygen uh, exchanges between the two. The oxygen molecules exchange. They call it oxidation. And uh, that breaks down the very structure of the metal, how water can actually destroy metal, can corrupt it. And eventually that will create this uh, rust or decay on the metal and that will begin to spread and it, and it eventually will take over and the whole thing will lose its strength and become weak and then fall apart. So the whole earth was filled with corruption, this mixture from the corrupt spirit realm, the cursed spirit realm, uh, invaded the natural and mixed with it and caused this corruption uh, as a result of this violence. So violence causes corruption. It's violence meaning violation or crossing the boundary uh, that you're not supposed to cross, and that that uh, leaves behind or produces, let's say, corruption. Um, this is a breaking of the law, the boundaries. And so the whole earth was filled with violence, and all men were corrupt. Therefore, God determined that he would wash the earth with water to cleanse everything, to wash it all away, to baptize the whole world in water, to remove all of the flesh that had been corrupted. Why did he kill all flesh or wash it all away? Because it was all corrupted uh, with, a, with a corrupt pipe. You don't fix a rusty pipe. You can't fix it. There's no way to take the rust and remove it because there's nothing left. You know, the pipe is too weak and ultimately it's broken. It'll burst. It can't withstand the pressure. It's, it's destroyed. It's eaten up. And it can only be removed and replaced. Now, I might go one step further here, that this happens to all flesh over a period of time. Hence, for us believers, as Christians, the absolute necessity of, and thank God for it, a new body, a new flesh, a new body. Uh, because the old one is corrupt. It's covered, but it is corrupt. 
And hence, we the old body is always cursed. It's always under the judgment because it's always impure. Uh, that's why out of the three archangels, you have Lucifer that took the curse. Out of, out of Adam's three sons, uh, Cain was cursed. He represents the flesh. Um, out of Noah's three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, Ham was cursed. He represents the flesh. This is always the way it is. Even Israel had three kings. Uh, before they before the nation was divided and they um, were broken into multiple kingdoms, um, they had three kings: Saul, David, and Solomon. And Saul was the flesh king. You could refer to him as the flesh king. He was ultimately cursed. Ultimately, what all this points to for us that we should know and must understand is that God is three persons in one being. We have one God, but three persons. Uh, the, the triune God, the Son, the Spirit, and the Father. The Son, Jesus, became accursed, became the curse for us, and took sin upon himself as the scapegoat in uh, ancient Israel. Uh, during their Levitical sacrifices, the scapegoat would uh, have sin imputed to him. The sin of the nation would be imputed to, or imparted to, or placed upon, symbolically, upon the scapegoat, and then he would be sent off to remove the sin as far as the east is from the west. And this is a picture of Jesus taking away the sins of the world, the Lamb of God that takes away, uh, removes the sin of the world. So let's go back to Noah. Uh, the whole world is corrupt and uh, because of violence. Violence is the key, why God destroyed the earth. So God hates violence, basically. It says as much throughout the Bible. Um, so I did a study on the word violence, and not just on the word, but on the significance of violence in the Bible. And violence is a root. Violence is a key. And one of the things that makes this even more vivid or uh, easy to understand is that violence can also be interpreted to uncover. Um, that is a huge uh, insight, revelation. When you understand that, when you read the word violence, it means to uncover. And then when you recognize that Lucifer, the covering cherub, did you catch that? The covering cherub uh, was designed and made to cover God, much like maybe the mercy seat covers the ark now, or the throne, the covering cherub. And when he removed himself or lifted himself up in pride, he literally did violence in heaven. He introduced violence or uncovering into heaven. How did he do that? By simply focusing on himself. Instead of being God-focused, he became self-focused and determined that he would be like God. He would lay, lift his throne up above God's and set himself up above God. This is uh, allusions to the uh, images that we have of Antichrist taking his seat in the temple, which would be on the mercy seat. Uh, this is what we, we see is where the Antichrist will come and set up his throne and uh, declare that he is God. So we see the, the root of that is in heaven uh, during the creation when Lucifer uh, decreed and declared that I will be like the Most High. Um, so this uncovering is what I want you to remember. This is the takeaway from this whole thing. There's violence is uncovering, and because of uncovering, God destroyed man off the earth. It was in the beginning in a Garden of Eden where God clothed man with light. He was so spiritual that he was unaware of his physical uh, being. So when the serpent came into the garden and hung in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the knowledge of mixture, mixing good and evil, like water and metal, if you will, um, when... Uh, and that brings up another interesting thought I want to share because I just thought of it, the mixing in the end of iron and clay. And what is clay if it's not wet mud or earth and the water and you mix that with the iron and what does that cause? It causes a corruption and a, and a deterioration that's fatal. And in the, in the picture where we see this implication of the mixing of iron and clay, it's in the ten toes of the man in the image or the dream uh, in, in the, the book of Daniel about the end times prophecy of the, uh, the, the man, the image of the man foretells the, the generations of man, the, the coming kingdoms of man on the earth, and the ultimate end would be in the toes that would be mixed, ten toes or ten kingdoms in one that would be divided, uh, but basically the weakest part, they would be mixed with iron and clay, and that is corruption, just like the tree of life. Uh, the knowledge of good and evil, the, the strength and the weakness at the same time mixed together causes corruption. That's why God um, separates and divides, uh, because God doesn't like lukewarm. It causes corruption. Lukewarm is the very definition of corruption and decay. Uh, rust, again, is one of the best examples. If you have another example of decay or, or something like that, just write it in the description below. I'd like to hear what you have to say or what, what you think about that. Um, 
So Adam and Eve were then uncovered. You see, this is the first act of Lucifer beyond the deception. He violated them. He violated the word of God by promoting himself, by promoting his doctrines, false doctrines, uh, out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, this is, again, from the beginning, a prophetic picture of the end when they will call uh, darkness light and light darkness, all good, evil, and evil good. Um, it all goes back to the beginning and the, the author of lies, who is Lucifer, uh, that flesh, carnal archangel, if you will, um, the spiritually cursed angel, the fallen angel, and uh, the third of the heavenly hosts that followed him, uh, whose destiny, I'll add, was, is, was from heaven to the earth and ultimately will be in hell, that place that God set apart. I don't believe God necessarily created hell. I believe God set hell apart as a place, an emptiness. Remember, it says in the beginning, the earth was formless and void. I believe hell is a formless and void place, not that it is the earth. That's a false teaching going around that this is that we're living in hell or that it, hell is on the earth. No, hell is a place where God isn't. And that is probably one of the best descriptions of hell is the absence of God and all that is good. The absence of light, the absence of life, the absence of truth, the absence of faith, of hope, of love. Um, those things are absent in hell. And uh, I can't even imagine a world that is void and that void and that empty and that dark. Um, but that's hell. That's his destiny. But anyway, he uncovered Adam and Eve. How do we know that? Because it says that uh, after, they, after the fall, they looked and they knew that they were naked. They looked and discerned the flesh. They began to become aware that they were uncovered. And the first thing that they did instinctively, uh, because they still had a conscience, uh, they began to try to hide or to cover themselves. That is the root of religion. That's the first religion in the world is covering your sins yourself uh, with good works or with nature, with using things in the world to cover yourself. There's, again, mixture, mixing between plants and people. They took leaves and tried to fashion those into garments or coverings uh, to cover their nakedness. Uh, why? Because they had shame and guilt and they were afraid. Uh, those are new, all new things that entered in at that time. Uh, you have anxiety, you have fear, you have guilt, you have shame. Uh, that's the root right there. That That is the absolute root. You want to know how to get rid of it? I'll give you a really simple clue. You figure out, and it's not hard, um, but I'm, I'm going to let you work through this so that you'll get the answer on your own. Uh, you figure out what Adam and Eve had to do to get back into the presence of God in order to have that shame and that guilt and that fear and the anxiety of his coming judgment, of him coming and finding them in the state of disobedience and of sin that they're in. And you figure that out and you'll understand the key to overcoming guilt, fear, shame, anxiety, self-rejection, self-doubt, and, and isolation, and uh, yes, even suicide, um, because all of those things are rooted in that uh, sin and that separation as a result of the sin. So you determine that you are going to enter back into the presence of God and repent and open yourself up and confess your sins to God, and he's faithful to restore covering to you, to provide a covering, to forgive you, and to wash away your sins as though you never had sinned. Uh, oh, people, this is so incredible. Uh, I wish I could share this entire message with you right now, but it's going to take two or three messages, I think, to get the whole thing out about covering. Um, but what God did do was he killed a lamb and he took the skins of the lamb and he gave them to Adam and Eve and he said, here, put these on. So he basically showed them, told them, to told us that leaves are not an effective covering. Uh, things of the world, things that grow from the ground or from the earth will not cover you. Anything that is a result of your labor, your effort, your own tending, your own knowledge, your own understanding is not going to cover you or make it okay for you to be in the presence of God. It's not going to keep you from the judgment or the wrath of God. The only thing that will cover you properly is that skin of the lamb, that, that sacrifice uh, covering that was the lambs that now you put on the lamb and now you have this covering and you can receive the promise of God that the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head or in our case has crushed the serpent's head and has set us free. Uh, if you're not saved, then, then it is that, that uh, the seed of the woman will come and set you free. Uh, you need to consider that. Not, not just free from the devil, but free from the lusts of the flesh, free from the, the pride of life, free from the lust of the eyes, free from the, the fear, free from the guilt, free from the anxiety, the sleeplessness, even free from sickness and disease, because those are all results of the curse that came upon Adam and Eve when they sinned, when they fell out of grace with God, which came from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of mixture from the fallen Lucifer that lied and tempted them and set that tree up and drew them to it, seduced Eve into eating 
uh, partaking and actually listening to his words, believing, putting faith in him and in his word above God's, and then receiving almost like a communion, uh, him through that fruit, uh, the devil into herself and therefore becoming his property. She partook of sin and death when she ate his fruit uh, as a result of listening to his words, his doctrines, uh, she partook of that. She believed and received that and, and inherited the results. And Adam partook of it freely, being the type of Christ. He partook, I believe, out of love for her, not because he was deceived. Uh, the Bible tells us he wasn't deceived. It was the woman who was deceived. Uh, and for you women who uh, can't somehow accept the idea of submitting to a husband, uh, that somehow you feel like that's a violation of your rights or your womanhood or your, your being, um, you have been deceived. You have been partly at least deceived by the ways of the world, by the doctrines of the world. You've been deceived uh, and partly because of not knowing the truth, of not understanding how everything was put into motion in the first place. Um, and I would suggest rather than get into a political debate and discussion, you would go back to the beginning and read and study the story of Adam and Eve, the creation of Adam of one man and how Eve was fashioned, taken out of Adam and fashioned from Adam and then how she was deceived and uh, fell in sin, brought the curse, and then gave it to her husband and how he partook of that uh, and joined her. So let's take this picture of the covering that they received from the lamb, the shed blood of the lamb. Next step, and we see Cain and Abel uh, to reiterate this covering uh, where Cain offered vegetables or produce from the ground as an offering to God as a sacrifice, and Abel offered a first born spotless lamb as an offering. And God, again, verifies this blessing Abel's offerings and rejecting Cain's offering. Um, it's not a new thing. It's, it's a repeating of the old thing that they already had learned and were already told and shown. And this theme is repeated over and over through the Bible down till today and will be to the end. There's two paths to choose, a broad way that seems right to a man, the way of works, the way of the world, the things that are come from the earth, or uh, things that like life that comes down from heaven, the lamb that comes and uh, takes away the sin of the world, uh, the blood of the lamb. So let's get back to uh, Noah and uh, the ark, um, and then back to the mercy seat. Noah is uh, filled with wine from the vineyard that he planted. He's at rest, keyword, in, in his tent or tabernacle on a hill, uh, and his son, Ham, comes into the tent. He opens the tent. That's a violation. Uh, if you don't see that as an act of violence, then you're missing it. That is violence. He violates his father just by opening the tent. That's the first, and he looks inside. Then he goes in, and it says he removes the blanket or looks on his father's nakedness. That's the second level of violation. You see, there's two steps so far, but the third step is when he comes out of there, and he begins to share that experience but with words. He begins to tell his two brothers, Shem and Jepheth, what he had done. And I believe that um, this image of this event is a reflection of something that happened in heaven, in the real tabernacle in heaven uh, earlier, uh, even before the fall of man. And although it's not stated in the Bible, I believe this is a clear and detailed reflection of the fall of Lucifer uh, from heaven. Let's, let's go on. After he tells his brothers what he had done and and begins to describe the picture. Uh, they don't want to hear it. They don't want to see it. They don't want to know about it. They understand what's what happened, and they understand and know what needs to be done. So the two of them take a blanket, and my guess would be a sheepskin, because put it over their shoulders, and they walk into the tent backwards, and they lay that covering uh, over their father, and then they come back out. So there's a restoration of covering that's been removed. Now, isn't that familiar? Doesn't that sound like something that just happened 1,500 years earlier, uh, in the Garden of Eden, when uh, Lucifer removed the covering or exposed Adam and Eve, and God took a lamb and restored covering to them. So Noah comes out of his tent, and he knows what his son had done to him, and he curses him all the way to the end of the age and, and beyond, and then he blesses Shem and he blesses Japheth. Uh, that's another whole teaching, and we need to get into that uh, in, a, in another message very soon, because there's great implications in there. Uh, everything between Israel and the church that's happened uh, and this switching of roles and places and the tabernacle and all is in that prophecy that Noah uh, gives to his three sons at the beginning. So we will go back and revisit that. But I want you to see how the covering is critical, how violence was the cause of judgment, 
how that all men were corrupted because of the violence. It caused corruption. This is why God can't allow violence, why he hates it, or corruption or mixture in the kingdom. This is why we as corrupt beings, as sinful beings, are expelled from his presence, not just to judge us, but to preserve himself, his righteousness, and to protect us from his wrath or judgment. Uh, there has to be this separation to keep each where it is. This violence is the key to the judgment. And you would think that after the flood and they come out after the baptism, that there would be no more uh, violence in the world, that it was all washed away, but it wasn't. Um, just the, the effects of the violence, the corruption was washed away. But Ham reintroduces violence into the new creation and it is a new creation again and it starts all over again. Um, and the same thing it happens. He introduces violence, uncovering of the father and then the recovering of the father. So time goes on and we see now a Abraham is chosen generations later out of the line of Shem. And uh, out of Abraham comes Isaac, then Jacob, he becomes Israel, 12 sons, become the 12 tribes, become the nation of Israel, go into bondage for 400 years. Moses is sent as a deliverer. Uh, they're set free through the Passover, go out into the wilderness. Moses goes up on the mountain and God gives him the plans for a tabernacle. This is really important. And, and the seven pieces of furniture to furnish the tabernacle. And to begin to teach them, not just a body of slaves or a bunch of oppressed uh, peoples that, that were set free from a, a period of 400 years of bondage in Egypt, but he's now beginning to form and shape them into a, a nation and he's giving them a priesthood. He's introducing priesthood and, and law and order and structure and purpose. He's organizing the nation now in a new way. Remember, they came out of uh, Egypt after 400 years. Of course, they, they knew who they were based on their, their ancestors, the patriarchs, the 12 sons of uh, Jacob or Israel. Uh, but it had been 400 years since Joseph had uh, been cast out and sent down to Egypt. Then the rest of the family, the 70 and all, had come down to Egypt and dwelled in the best of the land. Well, then the story pauses and it's 400 years. Now, I believe this is a picture of the 400 years between the Testaments. It's a pause in the history of Israel, but there really isn't a lot of mention, if any, about that period from the time of uh, Israel gaining the best of the land in Egypt until the coming of Moses. There really isn't a lot of uh, detail, or if any, in the Bible about uh, Egypt or about Israel in Egypt. So Moses gets the plans from God for this priesthood and the tabernacle that their priesthood is formed around. And this tabernacle is crucial. It's critical because it's a new thing. It's something that no other nation ever had. It's something that nobody else on earth understood or knew about or, or had. It was literally a way for mankind, and Israel in particular, through a prescribed method of priesthood of many people, the whole nation, participating in the first court, coming to the outer court um, that was exposed to the natural light, the brazen altar or the cross, where the lamb was sacrificed, and the laver of washing, which is baptism. Uh, and then going back out, the many, the whole nation, coming to the first participating, or the whole body, if you will, that's under the curse, coming there. But out of the many, a few were chosen, which was the Levites, the one tribe of the 12 that God had organized in campments around the tabernacle in the wilderness. And the Levites are then called, uh, chosen to come to the inner court, where the candlestick and the table of showbread and the altar of incense are located. And they would minister there. But uh, every year, the Levites would elect one man to be the high priest for that year. And he would be uh, given the commission to prepare himself to enter in at the end of the year during the third feast of tabernacles into the Holy of Holies in the third court and stand before the mercy seat. So this is the this is the pattern. And this happened year after year after year. The sacrifices, the, the, uh, the ministering of the candlestick and the showbread was constant, the daily bread, the showbread. And it's interesting that they were baking fresh bread daily and putting it on the mercy seat on the inside. While on the outside, they were out gathering every day for daily bread, the manna. You see the the correlation there. And it's interesting that the uh, while this was happening in the wilderness, they had the candle stick that they were ministering to intending and keeping those wicks trimmed, keeping the oil filled and keeping those flames burning so that there was light in this inner court to illuminate the bread and uh, the spiritual life. In other words, the spiritual light on the outside of this tabernacle experience, the whole nation was experiencing the pillar of fire and the pillar of smoke or cloud every day that was leading them and guiding them on the way and giving them great comfort, knowing that they were indeed being led and guided by the Lord God himself, um, that, that this was a sign that was constant and uh, familiar to them. So coming into the mercy seat, the high priest would be re constantly reminded of this experience from the Garden of Eden, that there would be eternal life as a reward at the end, uh, that they would be again able and allowed to eat from the tree of life. Uh, I don't believe they understood it fully, if at all, uh, any more than most Christians today fully understand the uh, teaching or the implications of it. Uh, but nevertheless, it's there. So then the mercy seat and the blood 
on the mercy seat are the covering. So I want to give you a couple of other stories to understand why the blood on the mercy seat and what that implies and what that means and how that has anything to do with covering. Let's go back to the story of Joseph. He was the favorite son. He put a glorious, colorful robe on him. He was sent out one day in the, wearing that robe to check on his brothers, Israel. And when they saw him coming, they resented him. Uh, based on his prophecies or dreams and visions that he had had, and specifically, uh, he had had two dreams that showed that all the brothers and even mom and dad would bow their knee to him. A picture, of, obviously, of Jesus who says that his coming, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. So they saw him coming, and so they plotted against him to get rid of him, to kill him, to remove him, uh, so that they could retain their positions. And so they did. They they uncovered him. This is this is what I want you to see. They took off his robe. This is a picture of Jesus, obviously, who was uncovered. Uh, so that brings in violence again. And they took the robe, they, they kept it, and they sold uh, Joseph the next day to the Gentiles. And they took that robe, and they, that night they were worried about what to do. They were, had this guilt and this shame and this fear, of course, because of their sin. They, want, they were afraid to go back and face the Father now or knew that his wrath was imminent because of what they had done. And so to cover themselves, they had a plan, and they killed a lamb, and they ate the lamb, and they put the blood on the coat. And then when they went home, they took this coat with them, and they handed it to their father and uh, as an offering, as an atonement, as, as an explanation. Uh, and basically, it became as a covering to them. It was their excuse uh, for what had happened to them. And without even maybe fully understanding, or maybe they did understand, they were actually blaming a wild animal for their sin. They wanted the father to get mad at a beast. And, and basically, here's the evidence that we didn't do it, but the beast, the wild animal, the, the wolf, the coyote, the whatever, uh, killed your son. So be mad at him and uh, see, here's the evidence. This is the coat, the covering, and there's the blood on it, uh, his blood to prove. The blood of the lamb proves that, that we are innocent. And that's the key that I want you to uh, note in there. The, the blood on the coat uh, was speaking to the father that they were innocent and it covered their sin and that never came up. And, and instead the judgment went on the unknown, the beast, the, the wild animal, whatever it was that imagined to kill uh, Joseph. So this, what does this have to do with the mercy seat? We put the blood on the mercy seat and it's a reminder, it's a symbol of that event that the blood on the mercy seat uh, removes the sin or washes away the sin, if you will, uh, substitutes for us. It takes the punishment for and the place of our guilt, our sin, it removes it. Now, let's go just one step further here, uh, where in Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, dies on the cross and sheds his blood, and he's placed in a tomb, wrapped up in a cloth, grave clothes, a covering, if you will, and then the third day he rises, so he's not in the tomb anymore, he obtains his new body, his glorified body, and the tomb is opened, and just like the veil was opened as a witness, as a testimony for, for his followers to see and behold uh, that he's not there, that he's actually risen to declare the glory that the, that the death can no longer hold you. Couldn't hold him, so it can't hold us. He went first and made a way. Uh, the grave can no longer hold you. Uh, there is no sting in death or no victory in the grave. Um, and that's, that's all depicted in the resurrection, that we have liberty. He was in hell but he went to hell as the victor, and he spoiled hell. He took captivity captive. He took plunder from hell. He took the captives, those that had been held there as captives, as, as uh, prisoners, as hostages, if you will. Um, all that were his were set free and let out. So Jesus' blood, the blood of the Lamb, he now, being our high priest, took that blood from this outer court, which the cross fulfills the outer court. It's the real that the outer court is a shadow of, and he took it into heaven, and he placed it on the real mercy seat, that is the real covering of the real throne uh, in heaven. And that blood now speaks forever uh, grace or mercy to us. Mercy, which is applied grace. Grace gives you mercy. If you, if you receive grace, you, what you get is actually mercy. You obtain mercy. And mercy always results in life uh, and blessing rather than the other side, which if you get the law, you get uh, judgment, and judgment always leads to death. So the blood on the mercy seat always speaks of our innocence. Even though we're not innocent, it's a substitutionary uh, sacrifice, which blood speaks of innocence. And that innocence means that we're not guilty of whatever we were accused of. 
whatever the accuser brings against us, that evidence of the mercy seat and the blood on the mercy seat, that the price was paid or the debt was paid, or it's as though or as if we never had sinned, that blood on the mercy seat is a testimony. It declares and decrees for eternity that we are innocent and thereby able to enter into the presence of God and that have that, again, that communion, that fellowship with God because of the covering, because of the substitution, because of the mercy seat. It's so vital that we understand this, not in the sense of the tabernacle, but in the sense of the real, that Jesus is the lamb that was sacrificed in the outer court of the tabernacle. His blood that was shed and placed on the horns of the altar that the high priest takes and goes into the Holy of Holies with and puts on the mercy seat, that blood is the blood of Jesus that we sing songs about. Uh, the Oh, the blood of Jesus, the uh, cleansing blood that cleanses us and washes us and makes us whole and makes us new. That blood is the blood of the lamb that was literally placed on a mercy seat in a tabernacle in the wilderness uh, and in the temples following. Uh, but the, but those are gone now and because we have the real. The real is the tabernacle in heaven. Now, I want to go a little bit further and give you one more example uh, and, and end it with this. Uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, in the law of God, there was provision made for false accusation. And I want to share with you something that is obscure, that is going to suddenly make a lot of sense to you and add a tremendous uh, insight into this pattern, this description that we're talking about, the, the mercy seat and the blood of the mercy seat, the covering, the cherubim watching over the two brothers, the two angels that restored the covering and how that all affects us and how it affects God how it's a provision for our salvation, uh, how literally covering and the blood are our salvation. In the Old Covenant law, provision was made for a woman who was married. If the husband at some point became unhappy, and this is in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, you can look it up in the law, um, if the husband will become unhappy with her and somehow then defame her or declare that he wanted to divorce her because he found that in fact she's not a virgin, um, then that was a serious penalty. The penalty for that, for not being, uh, as you claim, not being perfect, let's put it that way, uh, would be death by stoning. If it was found that she was not a virgin at her marriage, uh, she would be stoned to death. It gives all new insight into the fact that Mary was a virgin, uh, that, that Jesus came into this world through a virgin um, uh, as witnessed by God and by Joseph. So, the, if, if the husband would take this to court and declare that he wanted a divorce from his wife because of this, then her father would come to the court with the evidence to prove that she was a virgin. Now, what was this evidence? It was the wedding bed covering. It was the sheets the, with, the, with the blood stain on the sheets that would speak on her behalf to verify and validate that she, in fact, was a virgin when they married. Um, so why is this in the Bible? If it's not to uh, lay the groundwork, if it's not to in, in codify in the law this ritual, this ceremony, this, this principle of vindication by the blood, by the covering, uh, that it, it defends us against the law and the judgment that's coming. Now, the blood of Jesus is our offering. He's given that to us, and the mercy seat is a provision for us. It's that evidence, if you will, that we, in fact, are, are righteous. That when the accuser of the brethren, uh, who is the, the, the devil, Lucifer, the serpent, Satan, comes before God and uses the word of God to accuse us of anything, God brings out the mercy seat and declares and shows, and it's beyond, it's irrefutable evidence. It's beyond reproach. It cannot be um, denied. Uh, there's no refutation of that. That evidence is valid. It stands up in court that we, in fact, are accepted as righteous, as uh, acceptable to God. Um, so there's many other places in the Bible uh, that you can do a further study about covering. Uh, I'll give you just a couple would be uh, Noah's Ark and how the Ark itself was a covering and took the punishment, how Tamar and the story of Judah uh, was rejected unable to be redeemed or saved to have a child uh, by her husbands, but ultimately was covered by putting off the mourning clothes and putting on the raiment of a prostitute. Very interesting how God hides his patterns in the most obscure places, so you won't look there for a, a revelation of righteousness, but he hides that 
pattern there of covering as she puts on this face covering and this white garment and sits in the way and is thereby acceptable to Judah. When in reality, as her as his daughter-in-law, she wouldn't be acceptable. Um, but because she was unredeemed and unloved, uh, there's a provision made for her by this covering. And this, folks, is our salvation. And um, I encourage you to pray about it, look deeper into the Word of God, to do some study on your own, and to thank God uh, for providing for us uh, evidence and substance that we might be able to stand before his presence uh, as though we had never sinned, as though we are righteous. With the covering of the Lamb, the shed blood of the Lamb is our salvation. Uh, how God, the incorruptible seed, uh, the perfect one, the righteous one, uh, the only one who's not under the curse, making him therefore the only one who's not subject to the law of sin and death, how that one, the lamb that's truly spotless, without blemish, lamb of God, that is required by the law uh, to be the sacrifice. Note all the other lambs that were sacrificed may have looked spotless and without blemish, but all of them were under the curse and therefore were not perfect or spotless. But this one, Jesus, was perfect and spotless and was declared, uh, even in Peter, the book of, uh, I believe it's in First Peter, talks about uh, we're not redeemed with corruptible seed, but with incorruptible seed. That is the word of God. Uh, that is our redemption, that this incorruptible seed became the Lamb of God and offered himself and allowed himself to become corrupt, to take on corruption, to take on sin, and to actually become cursed in order that we might become blessed. Do you see that? How he put on sin and death, or unrighteousness, so that we could put on the garment of righteousness that we could we could put Christ on so that we could enter into the presence of God. Uh, folks, I hope this is a blessing to you. I hope it ministers to you. Uh, I hope it makes you grateful in a way that makes you want to go beyond just thanking God for things and makes you want to worship God for who he is, um, that he could even plan and work this out over the eons of time uh, is, a, is amazing and awesome. And he deserves not only our thanks and our praise, but our worship and our adoration. So I pray a blessing on you. I hope you come back and watch more videos. Uh, and I thank you for again for liking and subscribing and sharing this video. God bless you.